Okay, welcome everyone to our next lecture on machine learning. We are still in section number 12 on dimensionality reduction methods on linear dimensionality reduction methods so far. However, today we will also look at a nonlinear dimensionality reduction method and that will be kernel PCA, which is a variant of PCA. However, most of the time we will continue to talk about principal component analysis the linear way and we are just talking about different ways to do the computation. And once we figure that out, different ways to compute the PCA, we will see how we can kernelize that method. Okay, so let's jump right into it. So it should be slide 71 here, or at least page 71 in my slides. Those of those you all have seen. So that is basically the summary from last time. Last time we've seen that the basic idea of PCA is to find directions that maximize the variance, okay? And we've seen that that's equivalent to finding like a subspace that is minimizing the mean squared error. And we ran through all the math and we kind of proved it like in an informal manner that that's the case, okay? Um, we found out that basically um, it can be solved by finding the direction of the largest eigenvector. So basically the eigenvectors of the largest eigenvalue of the covariance matrix. Okay. And similar for the other second largest eigenvalues and the corresponding eigenvectors. And that was then giving us a procedure for PCA, which you can simply implement. Okay. Just by programming it down. Today now we look at a kernelized version of PCA, right? PCA is a linear method somehow. Hey, linear methods can be kernelized. That's so nice. I mean, this is like the spirit of 20 years ago when people were kernelizing all sorts of um, linear methods from statistics. So today let's look at PCA, how to kernelize it. And this idea was first introduced by Bernhard Schulkopf, Alexander Smola and Klaus Robert Müller in an, in a, I think it was a, maybe it was a NIPS paper. I, I know it, I think this is a paper form Ah, what is the journal? I forgot the journal. Neural Computation. I think it's a journal Neural Computation. And the paper was called Nonlinear Component Analysis as a Kernel Eigenvalue Problem. Okay, and that is the origin of kernel PCA. So let's look at the title, what it really says. So it says Nonlinear Component Analysis. Actually, maybe a better way would have been nonlinear principal component analysis. So we are still looking for the principal components, but now for nonlinear components. And then as a kernel eigenvalue problem, this is telling us already something about the solution, right? So it's solved as an eigenvalue problem, as is the PCA. However, as a so-called kernel eigenvalue problem, and this will refer basically to the kernel matrix. So that we are solving an eigenvalue problem for the kernel matrix. That's kernel PCA, okay? Instead of solving an eigenvalue problem for the covariance matrix, we are solving an eigenvalue problem for the kernel matrix. Hmm, that's interesting. Um, however, um, why is that really solving the kernel PCA problem? There are many more details in the book from Schulkopf and Smola from 2002, and there's also online material on it. So, but first let's discuss what is nonlinear PCA, okay? And I said here, see blackboard and I have my blackboard here. However, let's first look at some computer graphics here. So these are like nice visualizations that I got from um, a website from Matthias Scholz, who did his diploma by it at that point, it's like a master thesis on nonlinear PCA. Also back in the same lab where Alex Mola and Bernhard Schulkopf was in the group of Klaus Robert Müller. So he was there, a diploma student. And he was working then on nonlinear PCA. So this is a linear PCA um, description of a data set. So we have some data which is kind of now rotated in 2D and we find a new coordinate system like you see from these red lines. And they kind of define like a new coordinate that is kind of maximizing a variance and one that is orthogonal to the first one, okay? So that is an example of a linear PCA. However, where the data possibly is embedded in a higher dimensional space and then we find these two directions. So as an example of nonlinear PCA, consider like a data set which is like going around some in some segment of a circle. So it's like spread out around that one. And there now the nonlinear component would be a coordinate system that is kind of following kind of this, this kind of curvature. Okay, so you see that one coordinate is going like exactly around this shape and the other one is orthogonal to the first. So we are locally orthogonal to the other components. 
And that is a possible interpretation of nonlinear PCA. Of course, this is not really a mathematical description, right? I mean, in linear PCA, we describe the two directions by using two vectors. However, here we kind of have something locally, right? Locally at each point, we need like a linear subspace, which is describing um, the coordinates. And these local coordinate systems, they must be all compatible with each other so that we can have like a coordinate system, which is going like through space and is kind of compatible in a small neighborhood here. So it's a much harder problem and it's um, not so well defined. So what Matthias Scholz was doing in his master's thesis was that he was using neural networks to fit functions through the data here. And there is a trade-off now between maximizing the variance and the smoothness of the underlying function that I'm learning here. So this is kind of, when we look at the data, this is the natural coordinate system. However, we could have learned a much wigglier function, which is going like, like a snake through all this thing. Yeah? And that would even increase the variance even more, right? So the nonlinear component, if we do it very wiggly through all the data, it would have been even a larger variance. So somehow in nonlinear PCA, there's a trade-off, right? Between maximizing the variance kind of in the complexity of the function, okay? And it's not super well defined what we are really doing. So each method for nonlinear PCA kind of follows their own strategy of having a compromise be be between being a good description of the data yeah, without overfitting the data. So kind of restricting also the possibilities. Here's another nice computer graphics from Matthias Scholz. So this is like a 3D version here. Okay, most of the points are on the other side of it, but, but you can see that kind of linear PCA is defining like a three-dimensional coordinate system, whereas nonlinear PCA is allowing to have these kind of curved spaces. And it's, you could also call these things like two-dimensional manifolds that you are looking for, or the axis, the arrows that are defining the coordinate system now become like curves. And actually there's a paper from 1989, I think from Trevor Hasey from Stanford University, and he invented these principal curves as a generalization of um, principal component analysis. So there's also quite a bit of work on this nonlinear PCA side. And um, the, the master thesis of Matthias Scholz was not the first one, but it's a very interesting one. So he really not worked, worked it out very nicely, right? And as you know from yourself, since you're a student, you're learning all these things and it's all new. So typically when you describe something, you will describe it in a simple manner, right? Because you want to understand it and you've wrote it yourself. And often that's very valuable, these kind of master theses that are working out a topic because they're explaining it so that also I can understand, even if I'm not an, a domain expert in these things. So have a look at his master thesis even, but I don't know whether it's in German or in English. I, uh, you, you would have to look it up. But he has also a couple of papers on this topic, which are which very nice. So in nonlinear PCA, the challenge, like written down with words, is to find like a curve coordinate system that goes through the data. And however, there are two opposing goals here. One is kind of simplicity of the mapping and the other one is maximizing the variance. And typically, most methods that are proposed for this kind of nonlinear, let's call it nonlinear dimensionality reduction, that's what the Wikipedia article is called. Yeah, there are many approaches. Maybe let's quick, click, quickly click on it and go through it. So this is like the some famous Swiss roll um, nonlinear manifold thing and we can unroll it to get like a 2D representation. However, there are many methods as you can see here, starting with Salmon's mapping, self-organizing maps and so on and so forth. Let's look at the first two maybe. So this um, Salmon's mapping, just to get a feeling. So this is a very old work, so let's have a look at um, how old is it. So this is the link basically. So this is from, oh, this is new 2007. What was that one? Um, 2011. Now, but this, this self-organizing maps, they are super old. So actually they must be very old. They are called Cohonen maps. And what is the reference here? Where is it? Uh, okay, it was already invented in the 1980s, right? So basically in the 1980s, people were playing with neural networks and then they said those are very general learning machines. Yeah, so let's try to learn also nonlinear manifolds. What does it tell us? So basically many of the ideas that are people today doing with deep learning with neural networks have been done already on smaller data sets and in lower dimensions by many interesting researchers already. So and having many interesting ideas. 
Today, often it's just translated then to a modern setup or scaled up to higher dimensions. However, this kind of stuff, a so-called self-organizing map, it's just a, a, a description of what's going on. So basically, I'm looking for a map through the data where now this 1D space that I'm looking for is like a, a mapping of the data. And then comes KPCA, which is from 1998, as I said, and many other methods follow after this, including ISOMAP and LLE, which we will look at next time, okay? However, today, we will look at a kernel PCA variant. So we will try to non-linearize PCA. That's the word that I cannot say. Sorry about that. Um, using the kernel trick. Okay, so that is so intuitive, right? So we kernelize SVMs and we understood how to do it. Let's take another super useful method like PCA and let's try to kernelize. And ideally something great comes out of it. And we will look at the results that we get with kernel PCA and the results are great. However, we don't get these nice coordinate systems always as we want. So we get something else, something interesting, something useful, but it's not exactly the answer to the question, like finding a nonlinear coordinate system. But nonetheless, let's see what we get when we kernelize PCA. For this, let's have again a look at linear PCA. And you see already what I say, it's based on the covariance matrix up here. So this is basically the same algorithm that we've seen last time. And those are just the steps. So you calculate the covariance matrix, do an eigenvector decomposition, and then you do the right mapping. And the difficulty in implementing this is, of course, um, getting the transpose right, whether the data is along the row or along the columns. Usually the mass is much nicer if the data is along the columns. However, when you implement it today in computers, in NumPy, it's much nicer if you have the data points along the rows, because then you can reference to a higher dimensional data point much easier. So there's like a, a difficulty here, but I think that's something that we can solve. However, the essence here is that we are using the covariance matrix. So what is the requirement of the famous kernel trick? So the goal is to get a nonlinear version of a linear method. And the requirement is that the linear algorithm is only allowed to look at the data through a dot product, right? Because once we have the dot product, then we just replace all of those by the kernel function and we have a nonlinear method. So there are all these examples that I showed you. Let's look at the algorithm again and let's remove everything where we don't look at the data. So there are only two steps where we look at the data basically for calculating the covariance matrix and for projecting the data. Those are the two steps, okay, where I'm doing something with the data. However, here's a problem. So we are not calculating here inner products between vectors. Instead, we are calculating outer products, okay? So we are not calculating xi inner product with xj and getting a scalar. Instead, we are calculating all these outer products of a vector with itself, okay? So that's bad. So it's not so easy to just plug in here a kernel matrix. Of course, being computer scientists, right? Simple approaches, oh, let's just try it, right? Let's just replace the covariance matrix with the kernel matrix and then go on, right? And actually that's what, what will be the solution at the end. However, why is that a solution? Why can we also use the kernel matrix? In particular, do we have to adjust our projection afterwards if we plug in the kernel matrix here, okay? And so now what we will do is we will now reformulate the PCA but only using inner products, okay? So that will be the goal. And then at the end, we will have two ways to implement the PCA. We have one with the covariance matrix and one with the gram matrix, the one that contains the inner products. And those two versions are two valid implementations of linear PCA. However, the one with the inner products, we can kernelize by replacing the inner products with the kernel function. Okay, so that is the approximate plot. Okay, before we can do this, let's get some background material from linear algebra. Okay, and at the end, it is just now linear algebra, the tricks from the math lectures that we are using here. However, if you never understood eigenvector decomposition or singular value decomposition, so here's another attempt to explain it to you, okay? And for those of you who know already what it is, here's my, maybe a slightly different perspective. First of all, uh, let's understand that a matrix A can be viewed as a linear transformation, right? So the matrices are basically represents, they are parameterization of linear transformations. 
So for example, we have a matrix A with two columns and let's call the first column A1 and the second column A2, okay? Then what does, what do the numbers in the matrix really mean? Um, and this can be seen by transforming now unit vectors with our matrix. So the one unit vector is one zero, okay? And let's see what we get if we do a matrix vector multiplication with it. We get exactly the first column of our matrix. So we see that these numbers in here are not just numbers put somehow at a certain orientation, but each column is telling us something. So the first column is telling us um, the image of the first unit vector. The second column is telling us the image of the second unit vector under this linear transformation, okay? So <clears throat> now if we have any other vector, let's say the vector alpha and beta, yeah, so where we have the scalars alpha and beta on top of it, then basically um, the result of mapping this vector will be just a linear combination of the results of the unit vectors. And the reason being, of course, that the alpha and beta, right, can be also combined with the unit vector plus beta times the other unit vector, and that is exactly this vector, okay? Good. Um, for more explanations on this, there's a really nice YouTube channel on this topic um, from the three blue, one brown. So there's a lot of stuff which you probably already watched. And so there's a very nice run on linear transformations. And basically this slide is also motivated by this material here, right? So trying to get an understanding what a matrix really is and what it does. Okay, we see now that kind of this, these columns here, they have a certain meaning and they, they kind of tell us something about the mapping. Let's um, try to formulate an interesting puzzle, okay? So let's say we start with a matrix A, okay, which has these two columns. And now our puzzle is the question, can we find two orthonormal vectors, V1, V2, where orthonormality means that their length is one, okay, and that they are orthogonal to each other, okay? So orthonormality means they are normalized and they are orthogonal. So a short way to write it that their inner product is equal to these Iverson bracket thing, or you maybe might, might like the Kronecker delta function for this notation, it's the same thing, okay? And the question is, can we find two vectors that are in a right angle to each other in such a way that their images are also orthogonal, okay? So the input is like two vectors, and um, let's say this is the first unit vector, this is the second unit vector, yeah, when we map them, we will get two other vectors out, possibly these ones, where this is now A1 and this is A2, okay, the first columns and the second column of our matrix, and they are typically not orthogonal to each other, right? So A1 and A2 are not necessarily orthogonal. So for example, the unit vectors here, the 1, 0 and the 0, 1 vector, they don't solve this puzzle, okay? So they lead to something else. However, are there somewhere two vectors that are orthogonal to each other. So in 2D, I can just rotate around all possibilities. And I'm asking whether there's one possibility where then if I map them, the result will be also orthogonal to each other. Okay, so that is the puzzle we want to solve. Of course, the images are now new vectors. Okay, so let's give those a name and let's write them in such a way. Let's write these images of V1 and V2 as W1 and W2. However, let's assume W1 and W2 have also unit length and we write the change of the length. So the, the change of the, um, yeah, so the change, the scaling of the vector as tau1 and tau2. So those are two scalars, okay? So basically now I just gave names to the solutions of AV1 and AV2 and I call the solution tau1 times W1 and tau2 times W2. And now, Having rewritten my puzzle like this, um, I can also rewrite it using matrix vector multiplication or matrix matrix multiplication. So I could stack the um, V1 and V2 column vectors into a matrix, the same as A1 and A2 is stacked into a matrix. And I could say A times the matrix V1, V2. And this thing is exactly computing the thing before. So row times column, row times column basically computes tau times w1 and again row through the a times the column of v2 and the second row of a times the column of v2 is computing the tau w2 okay so now this can be also rewritten <clears throat> as you know okay so here's the tau1 and tau2 missing so i need to 
changed it. So this is not tau and tau, so this is tau one and this is tau two. So this can be also written like rescaling my um, column vectors w1 and w2 with the diagonal matrix. Okay, recall that by multiplying from the right with the diagonal matrix, I'm rescaling the columns. If I multiply a diagonal matrix from the left, I'm rescaling the rows. So here I need to rescale the columns. That's why I'm multiplying it from the right, okay? So now giving a name to this matrix V1, V2 and call it just this matrix capital V and give it a name to this W1, W2 and call it W and give a name to my diagonal matrix and let's call it lambda. I can rewrite this equation also as A times V being equal to W times lambda. Okay, now what have I done? So I'm starting with this puzzle question, right? Find like orthogonal vectors that are in a right angle to each other in such a way that when I map them, I will end up with another orthogonal system, okay? And the length can change arbitrarily. Yeah, that's why I introduced these tau one and tau two, but I want to have a description also with unit length vectors for the W1 and W2. And now by first starting with these two equations and then writing them in a matrix fashion, I'm having this very shortcut formulation where I only need five hits on the keyboard to type it down, okay? Okay, I need to press shift from time to time. So this is now um, basically reformulating our puzzle and I can even reformulate it further and then you will recognize the solution possibly, right? If you know it from linear algebra. So basically now I could multiply from the left with V transpose, okay? And if I do it, yeah, maybe I do this on the board and I do this at length. So maybe some of you are already um, bored, but let's do it in detail once. So what I'm having here is I'm having A times V is equal to W times lambda. And now I said that the V being equal to V1, V2, that those two vectors are orthogonal to each other. Okay, so that means that V1 times V1, V1 times V2. So let's write it all out. that basically this matrix should be the matrix one, zero, one, or <clears throat> I could also say identity. And this matrix can be also written very shortly like V transpose V, okay? It's exactly the same thing. So it's row times column, but the row of a transpose matrix is of course it's column. So it's a column times the column over here and all pairs, okay? So now writing V transpose V being equal to identity matrix is now a very short way to say the columns of V are ortho orthonormal, okay? Or another way to say the V is unitary. So that's basically a property of a matrix, which is exactly that, that the columns are unitary, okay? So what does it buy me? It buys me when I take this equation and I multiply from both sides now uh, the V transpose, to the side, then ideally I can remove that one. And um, if the V transpose V is a squared matrix, then we also have it the other way around, okay? Then basically um, the left inverse is the same as the right inverse, and so I can also have it the other way around. And that's what I'm using over here. So that is just the matrix A, okay? And we end up with A being equal to W times lambda times V transpose. So now what is this? This is exactly the singular value decomposition. Okay, so this is exactly the SVD. So SVD, singular value decomposition. <clears throat> okay, what I've just shown you is just a, a story how to get to the singular value decomposition. And I got this story again from YouTube. So I'm a big fan of YouTube and Wikipedia, you know already. So it's, there's a really nice channel on stochastic stuff and they have a YouTube video where they basically go through this explanation in very detail with very nice animations, very nice, much nicer animations that I can do on the board, okay? So basically this puzzle here, can we find a basis or like a like an like two vectors that are orthogonal to each other and in such a way that if they are mapped by my matrix A, they are again orthogonal to each other. And the answer is yes, we can, 
And the solution is computed exactly by the singular value decomposition. Okay, so another way, so what answer is the SVD answering? It's answering this question, find like an orthonormal system that gets transformed and at the end is orthonormal as way as well. How, however, typically we write it down as X times U times SV and having the V transpose on the other side, sometimes it's, it's um, hard to see that this thing is the answer to that question, okay? However, there is another interpretation for this um, notation. The other is, so if I have a, a, some vector, how does, the mate, uh, how does the mapping go if I map it with my matrix X? And it basically says any mapping can be done as follows. First, rotate your space, then rescale your axis, and then rotate somewhere else. Okay, so that is what the SVD is also telling us. So you do some rotation with my VT here. So it's an orthogonal matrix. So it's like a rotation matrix. Then you rescale the axis. Yeah, I'm rescaling the axis because S is the diagonal matrix. And then you rotate somewhere else. And I'm saying rotate somewhere else and not rotate back because the U is not equal to the V. So the U can be something else than the V. Okay, so far so good. Um, Let's look at, at a bit more details here. So first of all, our matrix X here, does it have to be a square matrix? No, it doesn't, right? So it can be any matrix. It can be even a rectangular matrix. And then let's think about what does that then mean? So how does this work? I mean, then we need to be careful now about the sizes, okay? So let's assume um, that the X is a D by N matrix. Okay, maybe I should have written it down up here that this is a D by N matrix. Um, then basically I have a rotation matrix V over here that is N by N. So it's rotating basically my input space. Yeah. Then after rotating it, I'm rescaling it. And then I'm kind of getting rid of some of the dimensions and I'm rotating in a lower dimensional space. Okay. So basically that's what we are doing here. Let's look at the visualization. So there are two cases. Let me first show the two cases. Either the number of rows in X is larger than the number of columns or the other way around, okay? And then again, having these boxes, yeah, we can now see what's happening. So suppose now the input dimensionality is lower, is smaller, let's say it's three, and the output is 10 dimensional, then we first do a rotation in our three dimensional space, okay? Then we rescaling it, this coordinates of my three dimensional space. So this is the diagonal matrix, which means it only has entries on this diagonal and everything else is zero. So also the rectangular part down here is zero. And being zero just means that it's canceled, okay? It's like ignoring it, okay? So basically um, we are in a three dimensional space and after multiplying it with such a diagonal matrix, we are rescaling these three axes and adding zeros to get like to our 10 dimensional space. Yeah, so basically these rows down here, which are zero, they are, um, so the stuff down here, it, which is basically adding zeros to my vector to get a 10 dimensional space. And maybe I keep it like this. And then I rotating the result into my high dimensional space. So um, I don't know, let's have a two dimensional sheet of paper here. So we have this sheet of paper. And um, basically, so this is now my 2D space. So that gets first rotated, possibly like that. And then the axis scale and the whole thing becomes, I can't do it visually, I would need rubber bands or something. The whole thing maybe becomes like a, like a um, not a rectangular anymore, but with different angles up and here, okay? And then it gets rotated into 3D space somehow, okay? So that is then the third step over here. Good. In the other case, um, where D is smaller than the N, basically I'm having, for example, a 10 dimensional vector. I rotate the whole space. I'm rescaling the 10 axis and then I'm getting rid of some of them, right? So I'm basically having lots of zeros over here. Yeah. And these zeros here, they basically cancel out like the lower dimensions and I'm restricting myself to a lower dimensional space, which is then again, rotated to get the result here. Okay, so here's a question in the chat. How does this allow for transformations that don't preserve the dot product angles and length? 
Um, the dot product, I think, is not always preserved, or maybe I understand, don't understand it fully, the question. So, and I haven't promised that we preserve the dot product. So, yeah, okay. Unfortunately, I can't hear you, but your microphone is um, on. Okay, but maybe we, we discuss it offline, okay? If you don't mind, okay. Um, so that's something for me to figure out about. The, I didn't think of yet about the, the dot product, how this changes after I'm doing a transformation here, okay? Um, or maybe let me try to understand the question with writing something on the board. So I, I possibly have like, let's say I have two vectors, um, uh, let's call them X and Y. And I can map both of them and ask about the dot product, for example, right? So I could, is that related to your question? Oh, I see what you're saying. So you are talking about the orthogonal ones. Ah, okay, yeah. Um, how, I mean, the A is now changed in such a fashion that I'm having this, or if you prefer, you can also put a lambda over here, okay? And the V and the U are really rotating the space. They are unitary matrices, okay? And they are preserving the inner product. So this can be seen very simple. So let's say we have a vector, um, uh, let's call the vectors A and B. Those are two vectors and I'm having a certain inner product or let's use our notation, it's A transpose B. Okay, and let's see what we get if we map those. Then we have A, uh, but we map it only by um, our V transpose, okay? We only use the rotation here, yeah? So let's use the rotation. So I'm mapping it with um, the rotation on the very right hand side and I'm calculating the inner product and let's see what we get out of this. So if I reshuffle the inner product here I will get A transpose times V times V transpose times B and now if the V is a squared matrix, right, if it has the right shapes then this thing is the identity matrix and so the whole thing is a transpose B. So this might be related to what you were asking, right? So basically it shows us that a, a rotation matrix will preserve the inner products and by preserving the inner product they are also preserving angles basically, right? So that's basically the same thing. And they are also preserving length since the lengths can be calculated from the inner products, okay? So that's, that's all fine. However, once I have this lambda matrix, this rescaling, now the inner products changes. And as you can see that some of the mappings, for example, if you start with the um, two vectors with those two vectors, the one zero vector and the zero one vector, and you map it now with, with your A, then basically you will end up with some vector A1 and A2, and they don't have to be orthogonal anymore, right? So they were orthogonal to each other and they were not. So in general, a matrix A would change the inner products between two vectors, right? But only for these kind of unitary matrices, we can easily see that they don't change the inner product and so they don't change the angles and so they don't change the length, okay? Okay, so next question. So rescaling basis vectors with different scalars means the angles, yeah. Exactly, yeah, let's think about that. So basically, um, okay, I give you an example. So I think now you are asking, let's look at a particular matrix A and the one that you like is rescaling the axis. So that one is rescaling the axis, right? So let's have an SVD of that one. The SVD of that one is identity matrix. That's my U times a particular diagonal matrix, that is the matrix itself, times the identity matrix, and let's write a transpose, whatever. So that is the SVD of it. So such a matrix is really just rescaling stuff. 
let's look at angles. So again, let's take this picture of having the two unit vectors, so 1, 0 and 0, 1, and let's see on what they get mapped, okay? And we know the first column is the image of our first vector, so this one will be mapped on the vector which has like um, now length 2, so it's a 2, 0 vector, and the other one doesn't change, so it stays to be the 0, 1 vector. Let's put brackets, that, that's much nicer. So the zero two. So and now, how about the angles? So it looks like the angles are still fine, right? So they are still ninety degrees. So where's the problem? So the problem is, let's take this vector over here, and let's see where this one gets mapped. So basically, it's a linear combination of the first one and the other one. So the coefficients are one one. However, if I map it, it will be end up exactly in the corner over here since it's a linear combination of the images. And now the angles really change. While this was 45 degree, now this is a smaller angle than 45 degree. Okay, so the angles change. Okay, wow, I learned, I learned more about the SVD with this discussion. I wasn't aware that this thing is, doesn't change the, the inner product, but okay, it does it. And um, this is a nice example where the angles do change really, okay? Okay, let's get back to this, this picture. So this is now writing out basically the SVD graphically, okay, where we have a squared rotation matrix at the beginning, a squared rotation matrix in another space at the end, and in between I'm having a rescaling of the axis and putting possibly some of the dimensions to zero. So this can be written in more detailed. So let's say I'm only drawing like a diagonal here where I'm having non-zero entries and I'm kind of chopping off all the other stuff where there's only zero zeros in here, okay? So what does it mean? It means that after rotating with my V, some of the coordinates of my n-dimensional ones will hit a zero in here, right? So here are lots of zeros, and when I do a row times a column of the result of V transpose times a vector, like the, the lower coordinates here of my mapping, they will hit a zero, so they get killed, so they get cancelled, okay? And similarly, then I'm adding zeros to the bottom to get the right size, to get the size of D, yeah? And those zeros now, they get rotated somehow into a high dimensional space with these um, last columns of U. And so these things, um, these now parts of these um, rotation matrices, they get names, okay? So basically, um, there's a null space of X, which is basically the set of vectors that if I map it with my matrix X, yeah, the null space is the stuff that gets zeroed out. And this is exactly spanned by V2. So V2 are basically those two rows, or basically they are columns, right? But since I'm looking at V transpose, they are these rows down here, and those are the ones that hit the zeros. And that's why they are cancelled out. Okay, so all vectors that are in this space spanned by these two rows here, yeah, those this is the null space. Then what about the range? Or in German, I think it's called Bildraum. And maybe sometimes it's also called image. So the image of this are all the vectors that I can reach with this mapping. Okay, and that is exactly described by the U1. So the U1 are now vectors in my higher dimensional space, in this case, the D dimensional space, and this is spanning the stuff that is kind of surviving here, right? So those column vectors are the ones that are hit by some numbers on the diagonal and they stay in here, okay? And we can have a similar discussion also for the uh, other rectangular case where basically now the, um, the null space again are these rows and those are the ones that are hit by zero so nothing changes, just a little bit shuffling around. Good. If you call the SVD a NumPy, it could give you these matrices D by D and N by N. However, they can get really large, right? And the stuff in, in here is zero anyway, right? So who cares? So for that, there's the so-called economy size version of the SVD, typically in implementations, and they give you smaller matrices, okay? So let's look at it again. Um, let's say this is a data matrix and it has thousand dimensional vectors, N of them, yeah, then somewhere it would be a ways to get a thousand by thousand matrix back because 
we are not using the full space anyway. We are only looking at an n-dimensional subspace of this. Okay, so we just keep the u1 in this case. And similarly, there's part of the vectors from the input that is kind of projected out, that receives a zero from my diagonal matrix, okay? So why not then limit my rotation matrix only to the dimensions um, that are kind of interesting and relevant here, okay? So this is a so-called economy-sized SVD. And again, there are two versions of it. So one for the case where we have more rows and columns and one vice versa. And in both cases, we will have a certain number of non-zero diagonal elements, which is here the K, okay? And for each of them, I will have an image space vector. And for each of them, I will have a row space vector, okay? And those are the economy size version. Now, where do we need to be careful here? Um, of course, if we call an SVD for the economy size version, we need to be a bit careful as follows. So suppose I'm having V transpose V and the V, the v is really, let's say, what was it? The N times N matrix. In that case, of course, all columns are orthogonal to each other, but since the left inverse and the right inverse is unique, okay, I can also turn it around, um, getting the outer product of all of these. So this is now telling me that not only are the columns orthonormal to each other, okay, but also the rows of my W are also orthonormal to each other, okay? And that is true for the full squared matrix. However, if my matrix is now only, I think it's V1, in the case I'm having these V1 matrix, I'm having a rectangular matrix, okay? So in this case, again, it's N times K. Is that a, a clever way to write it? Yeah, kind of. Ah, no, no, it's K times N. So, so in this case, I'm in the case that D is less than or N, okay? So if that is my matrix, now what? I'm still having columns that are spanning my input space and they are all orthogonal to each other. So I will have V1 times V1 is the identity matrix. However, if I do it the other way around, if I do V1 transpose V1, but now having the outer product, then this is no longer the identity matrix. As can be also simply seen. So K is here the smaller number. So at the end, I'm ending here with the K by K identity matrix. However, it would be an N by N matrix. However, the rank of this one is limited by the rank of the inner multiplication. So the rank of this thing must be less than or equal than K. And K is, not, is smaller than N. So for that reason, the rank of this matrix it's not um, N, so it's not a full rank matrix, but a smaller rank matrix. So it cannot be the identity matrix, which is like the, the, the most natural full rank matrix that we have. Okay, that is also something that you can try NumPy very easily, right? Just get the economy size SVD of a matrix and then calculate that one and calculate the other one. I will show you in, in one of the... Um, I show you right now. I show you in the um, in the notebook. I think I have it in there. So let's see. So here's the PCA notebook. And as you know, maybe if you went through the code, I'm also defining here random rotation matrices. Okay, and these random rotation matrices, they transform from a space, um, from a D, little d-dimensional space into a capital D-dimensional space. And here I typically want that the... Um, capital D is smaller than the little d. Oh, that's kind of weird. So I, I should have renamed all of this. However, so this is exactly what's happening. So if I'm um, computing these, I'm getting a mistake. So that's so bad. So random not defined. Ah, okay, maybe I should start at the beginning. Okay, now it's working. Yes. So now what do I get? I, I get here a, a matrix U, which is a two by three matrix, so it's a rectangular matrix. And basically the columns, so the three dimensional rows in this case, yeah, if you calculate the inner product with them, you get the identity matrix, which is down here. So you get a two by two identity matrix. 
However, if you multiply it the other way around, which is this one, yeah, you don't get the identity matrix, but you get something else. Okay. And that's because we have like two vectors which are orthogonal to each other, but in a higher dimensional space. And then those two vectors give you a two by two identity matrix, but doing it with the outer product, it's different. Okay. Okay. Um, so far so good. So that is the SVD. Okay. And it's answering a certain puzzle. Let's ask another puzzle. Okay. And I tell you already where this is going. This is now going to the eigenvector decomposition. And also the eigenvector decomposition can be formulated as a puzzle. So there we are given a squared matrix. Okay. And squared matrix means that the input space and the output space has the same dimensions. Okay. So instead of asking for like V1 and V2 getting mapped to W1 and W2, yeah, for a squared matrix, we can also ask, other vectors yeah, that are orthogonal to each other that get mapped to themselves, okay? But possibly as scaled versions. So let's call those two vectors v1 and v2. And now we are asking that if we map v1, we want to get v1 back. So we want to get, don't want to get w1, but now we want to have exactly the same vector back, okay? But a scaled version. And as you know, like for the example I had on the board, the vector one zero gets mapped to the, to the column vector A1, so the first column of A. And A1 is typically not one zero, okay? So typically like the usual um, basis like one zero and zero one is not the solution to this question. There must be some other solution possibly if there is one, okay? And again, on this slide, the point of the slide is to give you a, a way to derive kind of now this eigenvector decomposition starting from like an intuitive question that one could ask, right? If one likes puzzles. And here what I did is I just um, repeated the same stuff actually with the same mistakes on the slide. So this is tau one and tau two, where I'm now having uh, V1 on both sides. So I have V1 should transform it to V1 and V2 should transform it to V2. And if I write this out, Using the same notation, I end up with a times v is equal to v times lambda. And again, this can be now rewritten like a is equal to v times lambda times v. And this is a puzzle. Can we solve this for squared matrices A? Can we not solve it? And the answer is that for certain matrices that are symmetric, there's a very nice solution, okay? And there's also a solution for non-symmetric matrices, but let's here focus on the solution for the symmetric matrices. That basically if you have symmetric matrix A, it can be decomposed like that. So there is a solution to this puzzle, okay? Um, where again, these matrices will fulfill certain properties, okay? And those are exactly the same. So the V is a rotation matrix, the lambda is a rescaling matrix and so on. So now it means that if you have a symmetric matrix, the linear transformation can be decomposed as follows, first rotate the whole space, then rescale along your new axis and then rotate back. And so now we are rotating back, which means we are using exactly the same um, matrix for rotating for, forward and backward. Good. Um, you probably recognized immediately on the previous slide that this is exactly the equation, how we define eigenvalue, eigenvectors and eigenvalues in linear algebra. I think this is typically the starting point. And then you go on and discuss properties and come with the characteristic polynomial and all of these things. And they are all related to these two questions here. This is like the super short NumPy style vectorized matrix world notation for the, um, eigenvalue decomposition. However, it's also the one that the code gives you, right? When you call the function eig h, for example, or eig in NumPy, you will get a v and you get a lambda and they are in matrix form. And so when I'm using a, a toolbox like um, NumPy or Torch or whatever you name it and call the eigenvalue decomposition function, the first thing I will do is try whether I'm really getting the right answer. So what is the v, what is the lambda, okay? And I just want to show you um, how to do this. So this is actually really simple. So let's um, do that. So here's a random matrix. Yeah, let's start with the random matrix, let's say of size three by three. And this is of course not a, not a symmetric matrix. So let's symmetrize it by just adding um, 
itself transpose to it, okay? And let's check that this is really a symmetric matrix. So I hope maybe this is really small. So let's increase it. And so here you can see that indeed we get a symmetric matrix, okay? Never trust your code. Always check and look at it. And when you are happy with the three by three case, then you can take the 3000 by 3000 case and everything is okay. Okay, let's try the Ike function. So I don't know what we get. So let's say we, I just call it Ike. I think Ike, let's, let's use that one. And let's see what I'm getting. I'm getting a mistake. So, okay, maybe I need to do np.linike. This, okay. Okay, do, what do I get? It looks like I get a vector and I get a matrix. Okay, easy interpretation. The vector is probably the set of eigenvalues and the matrix are probably my set of um, vectors. So to check that they are really doing the right thing, let's give them names and then let's do some computation. So I want to see the output of A and I want to see the output of V times the diagonal matrix where I put all the values onto the diagonal times V transpose. And now I want to see two times the same matrix. If I see them, then I understand and I know how to use this, right? If I don't see it, then there's something fishy going on. So I don't know why my laptop is so slow. Maybe it's doing something else. Oh, Dyag is not, ah, damn it. So let's do it like this. Um, and what do I get? I'm getting exactly the same matrices. So that's perfect because that means the V that I have here is exactly the V that I had on my slides, okay? The columns of this guy are exactly the eigenvectors and the values over here are exactly the eigenvalues. So there's always a question, are the rows the eigenvectors or are the columns the eigenvectors? And by this, I can be sure that that's the case. However, you say, well, maybe the other way around it also works. So let's see whether it works as well. And we see that it doesn't, okay? So there's only one way to transpose the V to get the right result, okay? So let's put the right one in here. And then you get it. So putting my mathematician's hat on, implementing PCA, I just write down the code and at the end I'm surprised that it doesn't work, okay? So what was my mistake? The mistake is I should put on my computer scientist's hat and try every line of code and check it that it's really doing what I think that it's doing. So here's the possibility that you get V or that you get V transpose back. And you should check by hand before you just apply it into, in your methods, okay? And ideally comment on it and put comments in your code that now we, we know that Ike H or Ike is assuming that the eigenvectors are received as columns, okay? So that's super important. Okay, let's switch back to the slides, okay? so. That is the eigenvector decomposition, okay? Often we just write EVs, okay? So that's just for very short. Now the question is, are eigenvector decomposition and singular value decompositions related? And the short answer is yes. So how are they related? So for this, let's take a data matrix X. It can be any matrix. It doesn't have to be a data matrix. And let's look at the SVD. And then if we would calculate the covariance matrix or the gram matrix, yeah? Then we can just plug in now our SVD here. So we write X times X transpose, which is our covariance matrix. And here you see we are getting closer to PCA again. Okay, and let's see what the SVD is buying us. So we get an US V transpose V S U and the V transpose V is disappearing. Okay, even if I'm doing the economy size SVD, right? Because I'm calculating the inner products between the columns and that's exactly um, what I need to get the identity matrix. And in between now I get an S squared, which is basically a diagonal matrix where I'm squared all the entries. So that now is basically a form of an eigenvector decomposition. So we see by writing a rectangular matrix as X times X transpose and forming a symmetric squared matrix with it, and then plugging in my SVD solution, I get directly the eigenvector decomposition. Okay, so if my starting point is the data matrix, in order to calculate here these eigenvectors, yeah, I could also um, just calculate the SVD and take the left singular vectors. That's the same as calculating the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix.
So this gives us, by the way, a third possibility to calculate PCA, right? We can do the eigenvector decomposition of the covariance matrix. I will show you that you can also do the one of the gram matrix. And the third possibility is just take the SVD of your data matrix. So that's another possibility. Good, what happens to the gram matrix? So this is the matrix of inner products. And plugging everything in, we have the same effect that one of the um, unitary matrices just vaporizes. And we get also the eigenvector decomposition. And the surprising thing here is that the eigenvalues are the same. Okay, so the singular values of my data matrix squared are the eigenvalues of the covariance matrix and the eigenvalues of the gram matrix. Okay, so curiously, the left singular vectors are the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix and the right singular values are the eigenvectors of my gram matrix. Okay, and the squared singular values are the eigenvalues of all of these matrices. Okay, so that is a very nice insight and which is very basic to derive if you know matrix notation. So now what about if I have the right singular vectors? Yeah, can I compute the left singular vectors from them? And there's a formula for it. So there's a formula which looks like this. So if I multiply my data matrix from the left with v times lambda square root of this, I get the other ones. So let's flip back. So suppose I computed the eigenvectors of my gram matrix. Can I compute also the u, which are the left singular vectors? And the answer is yes, following that formula. So, and this can be proved very simply by plugging everything in. So let's do that. So let's just copy the stuff from my slide here. So we have x times v times lambda to the minus one. So that is the formula. And we want to prove that this is equal to u, okay? So let's plug in the SVD for that one. And I hope I'm, I'm not mixing it up, but I think it was USV, okay? Times V times lambda a half. Um, okay, great. So we recognize immediately the V transpose V here. So that is the identity matrix, great. What about that one? So the S actually turns out to be just um, the lambda squared. Am I now mixing up stuff here? I think that is, uh, no, it's the other way around. S squared is equal to lambda. So that's how it was, which implies that S is equal to the square root of this matrix. Of course, matrix square roots are always a bit funny, right? However, for diagonal matrices, we are fine. Diagonal matrices, the square root is really simply the square root of the diagonal elements. So there's nothing dangerous going on. That means that the S is equal to lambda a half times lambda minus a half means that it's also disappearing and what remains is a U, okay? So with a bang, I mean that I want to show this equality, then I plug it in, I derive something and at the end I have the U and this is then finishing the proof, okay? Good, so that's interesting. So it means that from the data matrix and the right singular values, I can calculate the other ones and vice versa. And of course, there's also a similar result for the sub matrices. Okay. If I take the sub matrices V1 here, I will get the sub matrix U1. Okay. And they correspond to the images that I showed you further. Okay. Good. So far, so good. So what does it buy us? So here comes now a computational trick. So suppose we have a super high dimensional um, data space. So the capital D is really super large. Okay. So that is exactly what we are looking for, for kernelizing methods, right? We want to go into a high dimensional feature space. And in this high dimensional feature space, we want to do PCA. And then ideally this corresponds to something nonlinear in my lower dimensional feature space, in my lower dimensional input space. So now the problem might be, I could do the eigenvector decomposition now of my covariance matrix. But this is super expensive because it's like cost D to the three. So if D is really, really large, this might not be a good idea. 
Instead, what we are doing, we're calculating the eigenvector decomposition of the inner product matrix, which is just an n by n matrix, and you recognize already this is the kernel matrix later on, okay? And this is much cheaper, and once we have the EVD of that one, we can use the formulas from the previous slide to compute the other solution, okay? So, basically now, um, I'm calculating the eigenvector decomposition of my inner product matrix over here, then I transform the eigenvectors of x transpose x into eigenvectors of x times x transpose using the formula from the previous slides, okay? And this gives us then an EVD, an economy size EVD of our very high dimensional covariance matrix. So our very high dimensional covariance matrix is d by d, however I can represent it with a much lower dimensional, for example, d by n dimensional matrix u1 and an n dimensional um, diagonal matrix lambda, okay? And that's taking as much memory as it took to store my data matrix, okay? So my data matrix was d times n, and then my matrix u1 will be also d times n. So it takes as much memory as the data matrix, which is great, or fewer. Okay, let's use this computation trick now to do PCA based on the gram matrix, okay? Here we had in mind being computationally efficient, however we wanted to get rid of the outer products for the covariance matrix. So let's calculate the EVD of our gram matrix, yeah? And then we calculate um, now our, um, uh, our eigenvectors of our covariance matrix, okay, just using this formula, and then we can project the data onto our new space. So now notice, so where's my mouse, there it is. So notice possibly the U could be super high dimensional, right? So the U is like a matrix of vectors, which is like the W for the support vector machine. So in particular now, if we are in a feature space, the W might be infinitely dimensional, which means that the U is, has infinitely many rows, which probably is also something that we don't want to um, perform actually. So the trick here is that now we plug in this U matrix into the formula for projecting stuff and then suddenly the U disappears and all that remains is the kernel matrix over here and the low dimensional matrix V1, okay? So PCA based on the gram matrix only using inner products starts with the kernel matrix basically up here. Then it's calculating um, uh, it's calculating the uh, eigenvectors of the kernel matrix V, and then we, we um, don't use step two, but we directly calculate the projections yeah, by plugging in now the V directly down into this formula, where we apply to the kernel matrix. So this intermediate, intermediate step here is not practically computable if my space is too high dimensional, okay? Because then the U will be this super large D, which for polynomial kernel function already, it's like exploding. Good. The nice thing now is we never have to calculate the outer product here, yeah? We don't even have to calculate the matrix U. Only thing we do, we calculate the kernel matrix and then we project using the kernel matrix. And actually this formula is very, very similar to the one that we use for the support vector machine to calculate the W. Okay, so far so good. So this is giving us now a version of PCA where we only use inner products. And now by plugging in the kernel matrix for X transpose X, and down here, we solve the problem. Did we? Did we already solve the problem? There's one little piece missing here. The problem is we are interested in the outer product matrix, the covariance matrix. However, if we follow this route, we typically assume that the data has mean zero. However, can we be sure that the data has mean zero in feature space? So maybe here's something missing on the slide. So let me put it on the board. So where's my eraser? Ah, the missing eraser, that's like a common problem everywhere. There it is. So for the kernel PCA idea, let me add some nodes. So here the idea is to go to some higher dimensional space, okay? So that could be R to the capital D, okay? We map it into this super high dimensional space and it could be even infinitely dimensional. And now we are having all these inner products 
between data points and that allows us now to define a gram matrix and so on and so forth. Okay, um, however, something that we cannot compute is the outer product xi times phi of xi, for example, which would be required for calculating the covariance matrix. Okay, however, the trick that I just showed you allows us to compute everything that is relevant from these expressions and we don't have to worry about that expression. However, this expression was assuming that the mean of the data is zero, right? Because otherwise we would have had something like this. So we first need to subtract the mean of everything here as well, okay? So sample mean, getting rid of it and then kind of squaring it, like doing the correct operation, okay? Now, what about that one? How can we remove the mean and feature space without mapping it into the feature space? How can this be done? Okay. And now this is the next thing I want to explain to you. How do I need to manipulate my kernel matrix in such a way that the data is centered? And for this, I need to center in feature space and I need to explain to you how to do that. So how can we deal with the non-zero mean? And let's use again, super powerful matrix notation. First of all, you know what the mean of the data is, right? You take the, the, all the columns of your data matrix, you sum them all up and then divide it by the number of elements. That is the mean, right? And this can be also written with matrices by saying I have my data matrix and now I right multiply a once vector to it, okay? So that might be again a bit surprising and a bit unusual, but it's really in the spirit of writing everything with matrices. So suppose this is your data matrix. So now what is this result here? So for this, let's write it out. So that is the, this is my data matrix with my columns and this is the matrix of ones. And then again, row times column is calculating exactly what I want, the summation of everything. So now if I normalize with one over N, I'm really getting the mean. So this is a very short notation to write out the mean, okay, in a matrix way. So in um, NumPy, um, the one vector is often ones of n, or actually ones of n comma one, right? So you want to have a column vector really explicitly. Now, if I want to remove the mean, so how can I write that? Now that I can rewrite now as x, time, x minus mu times one sub n. Okay, that's another tricky one. So what about that one? Um, what is this matrix mu times one transpose? This is an outer product where basically I'm having a column vector times a long row vector, okay? So the result will be a big matrix, okay? So where I'm having here um, D dimensions times one, one times N, and the result will be D times N. Now, what is it doing? Basically, it's copying the mu into my matrix. So every column of my matrix will be mu, okay? Which is exactly what matrix times row, matrix times row will give you, okay? So basically this operation here is it's a rep mat. It's also called in MATLAB, it was called a rep mat. So we are replicating a vector and stacking it to create a bigger matrix. Okay. So, and why is it interesting? Okay. I can subtract it from X. Okay. So I can say, I want to remove the mean from every column in X. So I can just subtract those two matrices and they will have the right size. Okay. So that will be like a big box like that minus. So let's, Drop this off. So basically this is a big rectangular matrix minus another big rectangular matrix. And then we don't get any problems. Of course in NumPy, you can also take the matrix, subtract a vector from it. And NumPy will broadcast. And broadcasting basically means filling the box, okay? And doing the right thing. But when we do the math on the, pa on the papers, we need to be more careful with it, okay? Okay, let's see. So we can write removing the mean as x minus mu one and n. Let's plug in our formula up here. Then we get minus one divided by nx and then we have the ones vector outer product with itself. Okay, 
Now, what about that one? So the ones vector outer product with itself, that is basically the ones matrix, okay? The outer product of the one vector with itself transpose is giving us a big matrix of ones. And then we can drag out the X and we get this interesting matrix. So X times identity matrix minus the ones matrix that got scaled with one over N, okay? And this matrix gets a name, it's called H. And so H is a so-called centering matrix. Yeah, and it has nice properties. First of all, it's symmetric and it's idempotent. Yeah, you probably have always worried about, so what is this idempotency in linear algebra? Who cares? What operation is it? Here we need it. Um, translated to our application here, it means if you remove the mean once, it's gone. That's it, that's idempotent. If you remove it again, nothing changes. Right, so if you apply a matrix several times, it's the same as applying it only once. That's idempotent, okay? Good, so we see that multiplying it from the right side will remove the mean of the data matrix. Great, that's nice. Let's see what's happening if we calculate now the gram matrix for the zero mean case, okay? So let's remove the, the mean, so which is now x times h, and we calculate the gram matrix, then we will see that by multiplying from the left and from the right with our centering matrix, we are removing the mean from the kernel matrix. So now what happened? We, we found a complicated way to write down removing the mean as a matrix matrix multiplication. And that allowed us kind of to, to, to delay the operation of removing the mean, right? By just writing down the centered data multiplied with itself to calculate the gram matrix and then we were able to identify that, oh, it's just the old gram matrix, but now multiplied from the left and from the right with the centering matrix. That's non-trivial to find out if you don't have this notation, okay? Now, suppose we are doing the same thing in feature space. So the kernel matrix is some inner product between some vectors here, okay? And this corresponds exactly then to the same operation. We have mapped all the data to feature space and we remove the mean in feature space of course, whatever the age means now in these super high dimensional spaces, but it is the right operation, okay? And so the um, curious thing is we can calculate the gram matrix of the centered data by just modifying the resulting gram matrix, okay? So we never practically remove the mean of the data in feature space. Instead, we just remove, uh, we just modify the gram matrix, okay? So that's the trick. So here comes kernel PCA now. So we have data points. We calculate a kernel matrix for some kernel function that you choose, okay, whatever nonlinearity you want to have. And then you find the eigenvalue decomposition of the centered gram matrix. So you need to multiply from the left and the right this H and then basically get the um, vectors V and uh, the, the vector lambda and some eigenvectors V. And then you project your data using the formula as before. However, make sure you also have to use the centered gram matrix down here for the projection, okay? And now this, when you just see the method like this, uh, everything is super surprising. Where do you come up with these formulas? They look really complicated. However, I think when you go through this stuff that I showed you step by step, yeah, then you see what we are doing here, ideally. Great, so let's apply it now. Let's um, look at some examples here. So um, let me show you some kernel PCA stuff. Again, I think you need to implement it. So I think the next exercise you will ask to implement a PCA version using the gram matrix, okay? Which is just a bit of linear algebra transpose and blah, blah, blah. So it's not included in this notebook here, which you can download. So there are two functions are missing. So um, which functions are missing? Let's see, I think I wrote it up here. So basically those two functions are missing. The function PCA of X and D is missing. Where I'm here explaining what the inputs is are that are expected by this notebook, okay? So maybe you implemented the PCA the other way around. So in order to apply or just run the notebook with your code, you would need a little wrapper that ensures that you are using the right transposed version. And there's another one called PCA project, which is also interesting and then uh, maybe I explain it in a second. 
And then there's the kernel PCA function, which is basically the same signature, but now additionally, you also have a kernel function here that you can give it, okay? And basically the kernel PCA is doing the PCA using the gram matrix and doing the centering by the centering matrix. And the first implementation here, that's the implementation that is using the covariance matrix, okay? So by, by following this kind of signature, you can run the notebook with your implemented functions. So, and I called it like this from ML solutions, I import all of these, okay? And then they are there. That's why my notebook is running. Okay, let's jump to the kernel PCA now. So here again, the same kernel functions that we had before for the support vector machine, okay? And then I have some nice plot PCA code. You can have a look at the details. Let's look at some data. So the first data is an arc. So I show you the results. So how can I show it? So oh, this looks a bit strange. Ah, oh, yeah, there we are. So this is the data, okay? So it's two dimensional data kind of lying on a one dimensional space plus some noise, okay? I just somehow generated it. And now what I'm showing you here is this is the first kernel PCA direction. So where is this direction now? Let's look at the code that how I plotted this. So let's look at this plot PCA thing. So the plot PCA thing is making a scatter plot, right, of the first and second coordinate. And then it's using the projected data of the first principal component as the color, okay? So the color is visualizing the value of the projection. So that means that the first coordinate axis is going like along the data from here to here, okay? So from very dark to very bright, okay? So that is now a way to visualize a nonlinear direction just by coloring the data points. Here's another dimension that we get. So this one is, unfortunately, we don't get like the one that is orthogonal to the first direction, yeah? So maybe let me draw a picture of what the solution would have been that I liked. Okay, my first coordinate is going like this. Great, right? So let's kind of draw like, I don't know, a couple of axes here through the data. So that is basically the first answer of kernel PCA. Ideally, I would have gotten as a second answer something like this, right? Something which is locally orthogonal to the other axis. So that would have been a nice nonlinear PCA answer, right? However, it looks like I got a different answer. So let's look at it again. So what do I get? So this is the second one and I get something large to very, or very small to very large to very small, okay? So now what went wrong? I mean, why is it not, it not orthogonal to that one? The answer is we are doing PCA in feature space. So that means we are orthogonal in feature space, but not in input space. So that is related actually to the question that one of you asked earlier, what is this with preserving angles? So by going to a feature space, I'm going somehow nonlinear into some other representation. And of course, um, the inner products are not preserved. So basically it means that orthogonality in feature space means something completely different than orthogonality in input space. So, but can we understand why this vector now is orthogonal to that vector? Yes, we can somehow. So suppose, up here we have minus one, in between we have zero, and here we have plus one, okay, as a coordinate. That means we have minus one, plus one, and minus one. And now if you multiply for each point, the two coordinates with each other that we get, we kind of cancel each other, right? So the minus ones get multiplied with minus ones, and the plus ones get multiplied with minus ones. If we sum everything up, we get zero, okay? So we are orthogonal in feature space. And like mathematically speaking, it's like saying my projection y, yeah? So let's say this is the y one coordinate, so which is a vector, transposed with y two. So that gives me a zero. So the numbers that I got for each of the data points, if I multiply them as inner products, then I'm orthogonal. 
Okay, here's another orthogonal vector. That's the one where I'm going from minus one to plus one to minus one to plus one. And also if I multiply this vector to the first one, I get a zero and similarly to the second one. And so this is like getting more and more extreme. So in a way, I'm getting interesting features which are explaining the data somehow and actually also neighborhood between data, but I'm not getting these orthogonal components that are orthogonal to each other because I'm asking for orthogonality in feature space and not in input space. So let's take another data set to learn more. So um, yeah, the cluster one is fun, but let's take this one. Let's take the so-called, I call this sheet of paper data set, okay? So sheet of paper data set is, I, my data set is sampled uniformly from a rectangle, okay? So I'm sampling uniformly from this one. So this is like a prototypical two-dimensional space, right? It's very obvious. The first axis is that one, the second axis is that one. And PCA will give me that solution, okay? However, what does kernel PCA give me? So it gives me this direction, yeah, we, we can look at it. It does give it to me, great. So that's the first component. However, the second component is like the first component squared. Yeah, so it's going from minus one to plus one. And if I square everything, it's going from plus one to zero to minus one. Okay, that's what the first component here is. The second, com the third component is the one that I wanted. Okay, that is the orthogonal one. And now the fourth component, I mean, I'm having a thousand data points, so in principle I can find a thousand components, right? And that are all orthogonal to each other. So I get these kind of checkerboard style thing and so on and so forth. And the curious things are they look like two dimensional basis function, like FFT stuff or like a, like a FFT on a sphere or something like that. And they are related actually. So there's, that follows actually from Mercer's theorem of having the eigenfunctions. They are corresponding to these kind of um, Fourier decomposition. Anyway, now we could experiment here and kind of making the, the sheet of paper shorter. So let's make it only um, squared or let's say, let's increase. Ah, no, now it's not working anymore. So, okay, let me run the whole thing again. Uh, restart and run all. Okay, yes, please. So let's reduce the size of the paper. Yeah, and make it more looking like a square. And then I would expect maybe the first direction is that one and the second is that one. And that will work, okay? Ideally, my computer is able to do this in time. It looks like it is able to do it in time. Okay, great. So let's see what we get out. Okay, now it worked. We got the first direction and we got the second direction. And then we get the first direction squared and then something other weird. However, if the first length get too long, yeah, then the second largest variance in feature space will be the first direction squared, okay? So it's not exactly what we want. Okay, what else can you do with it? Okay, time's up, but let me just show you. So this is another data set. So this is a data set where I created four clusters, okay? And then I run kernel PCA with a Gaussian kernel. And in this case, I got directions which are kind of nicely clustering the data. So already by looking at the first component here, I can really simply chop off one of the clusters. And then when I look at the second component, I can chop off somehow other clusters. So this is giving me a really nice embedding. And actually there's a clustering method that is exactly based on this kernel PCA idea. Okay. Good, so far so good. Um, I think that's it for kernel PCA. Um, just when you go through the notebook, there's some other stuff for you to find, if I can still um, search for it. So, there's also code to calculate these eigendigits and you can look at how to do it. So here's a nice function to plot the data. And then there's a simple way to pick the zeros or the ones or the twos from your data set. And then you can run PCA on some of the digits. For example, here I'm calculating the twos. Yeah, I'm using the twos and calculating the um, digits. And actually now those are the eigenvectors reshaped again as digits, right, of the twos. And as you can see, it's curious, it's similar to the KPCA stuff that we just seen, right? So this is like a Fourier transform style of thing with higher frequencies, the higher you get, okay? And kind of this is giving us um, like ways to approximate digits. So that's something that I'm doing next. Oh yeah, that's so-called eigenvectors, eigenvalue spectrum, which are the values 
So that basically means that the first eigenvector is giving me z much variance and adding more and more and more. I'm getting more and more variance. However, the gain is going down and down and down. Okay, so adding the 60s eigenvector is not giving me much of the variance. And I can ask if I reconstruct data from a few components. So let's just take the first 100 components of my data set and let's try to reconstruct it with only five eigenvectors. Yeah, then I can get this reconstructions of the data. So I get some of the tools, they are still great, but I get the ones maybe with the wiggle down here. And please have a look at the code, how to do these computations, okay? So it's really not super difficult. Good, let's wrap up with the slides. So those are pictures of it. So of course, oh, one thing, one last thing, one more thing on this slide. We've seen now two approaches, calculating the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix and calculating the eigenvectors of the gram matrix, okay? So far, so good. So the gram matrix approach allowed us to do kernel PCA, okay? So that was the story. However, there's a third approach that we just learned about where we don't have to compute the covariance matrix and we don't have to compute the gram matrix, okay? And so here it comes. You just directly use the SVD of the data matrix and then you read off basically the left singular vectors. And those are the principal components as we've seen today in the lecture. However, if you would introduce this method like that and say, okay, data matrix, here's PCA, just calculate the SVD and those are your solutions. It would have been very, it would be very hard to understand what is going on. What are we doing? Doesn't it have something to do with the covariance matrix, with the shape of a Gaussian that you fit or something, like the main axis of an ellipse and this kind of thing? And that follows basically by doing it using the covariance matrix. So in, in a way, if you have lots of data, the covariance matrix is kind of summarizing your data and then you're applying like the decomposition method to a smaller matrix, okay? And that can be more efficient to summarize the data by calculating the covariance matrix, then to use the SVD directly on your data matrix. So that could be a bit wasteful to do. However, sometimes if you just want a quick and dirty implementation, you just run the SVD on your data matrix and that's it, okay? Good, so here's the summary. We wanted to keep certain properties here in the PCA chapter. And then we found three possible solutions. So the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix, eigenvectors of the gram matrix, and just taking the left singular vectors of the data matrix. And that's basically everything that you can read on PCA, I think, can be put into one of these three cases, okay? Notably, the second possibility is the one that allows us to do kernel PCA because we can put in just the kernel matrix here. Okay, that's it for today, and that's it for the PCA section. Maybe now you know more about PCA than you ever wanted to know, but ideally now you understand why you can just run an SVD and you did, kind of, you did PCA on your data. So very simple method at the end, but there's nice math behind it. Okay, so thanks a lot for your attention and thanks for attending the Zoom conference here and let's see how we go on on Wednesday. Okay, bye-bye.